Our next speaker is Kate McGregor. Um, Kate's been very instrumental in bringing us all together tonight. Um, Kate is a burgeoning real estate developer, a former engineer in training, and a soon-to-be architect. Kate completed her education in civil engineering at the University of Calgary in 2006 and was awarded a Master's of Architecture from Columbia University in 2011. In the field of architecture, she has worked for award-winning architects, Young Projects, and N Architects, both based in Brooklyn, New York. In 2006, she began working on the master plan for Carrig Ridge, an innovative residential development near Ghost Lake in the municipal district of Bighorn, just outside of Cochrane. Kate saw, Kate saw the master plan for the neighborhood through the two public hearings, and the project is the first of its kind to receive approval in our province. Please welcome Kate McGregor. Thanks, Jen, uh, and thanks everyone for coming out tonight. It's so great to see such a, such a great turnout tonight. Um, I'd like to start by thanking everyone at the BAM Center that was able to bring this together with their hard work over the past few weeks. Um, Todd and Zita are both fantastic speakers and we're really lucky to be here tonight. Uh, as Jen mentioned, for quite a few years now, I've been working on a development project about an hour east of here called Carrig Ridge. Uh, this, at completion, will be a home of a community of 45 small homes, each on two acres of land, with nearly 2,000 more conserved in its natural state. This is a place that has been important to three generations of my family. It is both incredibly beautiful and a sensitive landscape. So we're continuously searching for architects who understand that the true luxury of a place like this is not a sprawling house overlooking a manicured lawn, but really about the opportunity to become a part of a spectacular natural environment. Uh, I came across Todd's work at Fogo Island a couple of years ago, and I immediately thought, this is someone who understands. I'll let Todd speak to his own work, but suffice it to say that for all their humility and simplicity, his buildings lack nothing in elegance, beauty, or luxury. As an architect myself, I'm incredibly excited to have the chance to work with him, and tonight it's a pleasure to introduce Todd Saunders to all of you. So without further ado, Todd. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, I, I just tell you a little bit about my, myself. Actually, I, I'm a Canadian, but I don't, I don't live here. I, I, for some weird reason, I end up in, on the other side of the world, in Norway, and people always ask me why. Uh, so, so I hitchhiked one time from Paris to China, and I found this little small town on the west coast of Norway, and I wanted to move back there and work for about a half a year. And so what happened, I finished at McGill, I put my thesis in the mailbox, and I went over to Norway, and I started work on a Monday, and then I found a place to live on a Wednesday, and then I met my wife on Friday night. So it was, a, <laughs> it was a run really quickly. And then, uh, so I thought I was going to spend six months there, and now it's been 18 years. So the next thing that happens, um, um, it was, it was just where I was working really hard one day uh, for, for a long period, and then I decided to take three days off from work to paddle my kayak down to the coast of Norway, and I get this call on the telephone. And she introduces herself, she says, Zita Cobb. I, didn't have a, I hadn't have a clue who she was, actually. But she had told me she had this idea for a project on Fogo Island. And I think I blurted out, I cut her off, actually. I blurted out and said, you know, I've been waiting for this call for 20 years. And then that evening, when I got to land, I sat down and I Googled her. And uh, it was amazing. It was like, you, you see, it, like, she's a very interesting person. So I, I started freaking out and saying, that it was, it was a, I was a young architect, it was in my 30s, and she could be the best possible client I've ever, ever got. And the next thing was, I, I was extremely homesick, and uh, it was a chance for me to go back to Newfoundland where I grew up to, to make some projects. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about six, we designed six artist studios, I'm going to show four of them, and we made a 29 room in, I'm going to talk about that, and then... Um, I promise you, since I've come so far away, I'm going to show you some of the work that I've done in Norway. And then since I'm actually starting to work here now in Calgary, just down the road, it's great. I want to show you some of that so you can get a bit of peace. So you, you'll see a big chunk in my life of what I've, I've done in Newfoundland, what I've done in Norway, and what I'm going to do here in, in Alberta. Yeah. So this is, um, so there's a lot of you guys in, in, this, in, the, in the audience uh, that are artists and are in artist residencies. And one of the first stu studios that we built actually was uh, based on my conversations with artists. They didn't want very much. They wanted one big, big ro simple room. They wanted uh, a view with some natural light. They wanted a place where they can be outside and work, and they wanted a place they can be outside if it was raining and work. Uh, this isn't actually, 
It's this studio is called the Long Studio. And what, what a lot of people don't notice about this photograph, there's no strings or lines to this place. Uh, there's no power lines to this. It's complete 100% off the grid. There's no sewage lines leaving away because it's compost toilets. The roof is covered with solar panels. Uh, and this is the type of spaces that I, I perceived as uh, what could be a good artist, a uh, place for an artist to work. And then we made a, a, a place where they can sleep. The artists actually don't live in these uh, studios. They just work there during the day. They're about, all of them are about 10 minutes walk from the nearest town. And they're spread around the, around the island. And what we did is we used the same wood on the outside as the inside. And uh, very simple detailing, much like the Newfoundland, the, the outboard architecture. There's no... Uh, how can I say that in a nice way? There's no bullshit about Newfoundland architecture. <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very straightforward. And this is the way I wanted this. I didn't want it over detail. I would get really sick of modern architects. It's just this overkill of, of showing off detail. This is very zero detailing. And so the artist could be in here and spend the night. And then this is another, the second studio we did was um, a, a twisting tower. Um, when I grew up as a kid, I had never ever seen a skyscraper, and it was I was I was, a, I was a, actually what was missing in Newfoundland. And my and it wasn't that we needed it, but it was it was you never got on top of a building and saw the landscape. So it was always this childhood dream that I could climb up on something that I designed myself, and then you can look out over the landscape. And the building actually, it's uh, it's quite it's. Um, it's out on a peninsula, and it's almost like a marker in the landscape. When people drive around or walk around the road, it actually turns the whole way. The, the bottom form is the, and the top form exactly the same, but they're twisted 180 degrees from each other. So the form follows itself up. So when you're going around the landscape, this thing changes and changes as you go around. What, what another thing I learned about Newfoundland is, as well, we, uh, it was some of the greatest builders I ever worked with. I was like, I, I never ever thought I was a bit like, when we went there, I, I hadn't seen that much new stuff that was built well. There was a lot of old stuff that was built extremely well. So we found a very, very good group of carpenters. So there's, um, it was just amazing working with them. So we would, I would fly over from Norway with, you know, 100 drawings under my arms. But when we'd be sitting in these work sheds, no one looked at the drawings. We were just looking at the models that these guys built themselves. So I was realizing that's, that's how they would use the, that's how they learned how to build. They, um, would have these half-scale models. There, many of them were boat builders, and they would look at these half-scale models that they got from their grandfathers, and they would look at them, and they just build the buildings like that. So, and this is inside. I just, I, I took some pictures from inside. You can get so a lot of this is published in the press, but you often only see in the exterior of the building. So, since a lot of you are in these residences, I just wanted to show you what they look inside. Very, very, very plain. This is actually just simple plywood painted white. This is one of my little favorite ones. It was, uh, it's called the Bridge Studio. And it took me a year, it took me, when we first did it, I thought we were being a bit too, um, uh, maybe a little cocky of trying to make it so simplistic. But it's actually become my favorite one. It's like this, uh, it's almost like the, the little sister in the family. The way it was, it was originally designed as a writing studio. And it's like a bridge you walk up into it. It's almost like a priest going up to the altar where they sit at the desk and they do the work. You look at this great view. It's a place to lay your books and the bookshelves to the thing, a place to sit and write, a place to put your pencils there. So it's all the basic elements. It's almost like a little small ship. There's no, there's no wasted space in this, in this building. So it became my favorite because it's, it's actually the one that reflects Newfoundland architecture in, in what I grew up with. Yeah. Uh, this is actually, um, it's called the Squish Studio, the Force Studio. Yeah, you see the, the head on the end there, th that way. So I wanted to do a, a studio that paid homage to this. Cause there's lots of stories about uh, this rock off in the distance where people would go and see if their fathers or their brothers were coming home from the seal hunt or coming home from fishing. And, and it's so rough out there, sometimes they didn't come home. So they wrote stories about this and sang songs. And it's a big part of Fogo Island. So this studio in some ways pays homage to this. And it's another way, these studios are almost like exclamation marks in the landscape. They change as you go around with them. They have their own character, very, they have their own personality. And it, every time I'm there, it's because of these seven seasons, it changes all the time as well. And when you look at this, this is a bit about what I grew up, my memories from Newfoundland were actually very simple colors. There's a lot of, when you look at Newfoundland architecture around the airport, it's actually, it's very colorful, it's like a bag of jelly beans. 
there's all these weird, weird colors. But what, when, because we weren't doing houses, we were doing studios that had a, there was no precedence for this. So we wanted to do something different. So I picked just three simple colors and white was one of them because it was memories of white win long winters. And then the black from the nights, it was like the long black nights. I can, you know, I still don't see this in Norway, for example, the, like the black skies with this amount of stars. There's another thing as well, the third color was gray. And the gray was actually from my memories of visiting my grandparents' house around the bay, that the fog was always there. It was just off the coast. It would just move in like this big monster in the evening. And then in the morning, it would be there for quite a long time sometimes, but it would just move out in the afternoon. So these colors, these three colors were, were my background. Uh, if you ever visit Fogo Island, I'd actually recommend to go in the winter time because it's like, it's, uh, we watched the film yesterday evening uh, about the making of the, all these Fogo Island projects, and I, I was filmed in it quite a bit. And I think the happiest time I was when I was walking down to this in this winter storm. It was this, it was this amazing beauty in, in the, on the island. This is what the, the, the studios look like inside. Yeah. So now what I'm going to talk about, we, 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 we built the studios as a practice run for because uh, we we had we knew we were doing this l large 29 room in that was just ahead of us but we used the studios as a practice run and then actually my our confidence got very very high because I, I i knew these builders were uh could do could do this i can remember actually after the long studio visiting one of the carpenters with uh, one of the models in, in my pocket and i pulled it out and this studio was just a new idea it's like what do you think of this it was a squish studio and he was just like it was like loving it, and him and I were just talking there. So we spent 30 minutes like kids just dreaming of how we could do it. And then when we came to the, when we came finally to the inn to do this, all these carpenters and everyone that was working in these studios were really prepared to do this. So we, you see at the end here, it's, there's 29 rooms. There's a, there's a restaurant to the right shooting out, and then the art gallery to the left. And then the way it is, it's, uh, it looks like it's always been there, this thing. We were very, 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 very careful with the landscape. Um, I can remember when we first started, actually, Zita was, uh, we had a meeting with the builders, and Zita said, uh, if you guys kill one blueberry bush, I'm going to kill you. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a bit that attitude. Like both of us are kind of nature freaks, and we wanted to really respect this, this old, old, uh, this, this, it's a rock, actually. And it's been there for millions of years, but it's very easy to destroy and very hard to repair. So, and it's the same with the vegetation there. It's a subarctic vegetation. If you destroy it, it'll take a long time to come back. And there's the restaurant looking off to the west. I can still remember one, the discussions we had. We, we were on site and we were turning it, you know, just one or two degrees because we knew the sun on the 17th of June, for example, was going to, right, to be right down. You could be there. It's six o'clock in the evening having a dinner watching this beautiful sunset. And there's some amazing sunsets in this restaurant. 